the little sea maid by Hans Christian Andersen. Far out in the sea, the water is as blue as the petals of the most beautiful cornflower and as clear as the purest glass, but it is very deep, deeper than any cable will sound. Many steeples must be placed one above the other to reach from the bottom to the surface of the water, and down there live the sea people. Now, you must not believe there is nothing down there but the bare sand, no. The strangest trees and plants grow there, so pliable in their stalks and leaves that at the least motion of the water they move just as if they had life. All fishes, great and small, glide among the twigs, just as here the birds do in the trees. In the deepest spots of all lies the sea king's castle. The walls are of coral, and the tall pointed windows of the clearest amber. Mussel shells form the roof, and they open and shut according as the water flows. It looks lovely for in each shell lie gleaming pearls, a single one of which would be a great ornament in a queen's diadem. The sea king below there had been a widower for many years, while his old mother kept house for him. She was a clever woman, but proud of her rank, so she wore twelve oysters on her tail, while the other great people were only allowed were six. Beyond this she was deserving of great praise, especially because she was very fond of her granddaughters, the little sea princesses. These were six pretty children, but the youngest was the most beautiful of all. Her skin was as clear and as fine as a rose leaf. Her eyes were as blue as the deepest sea, but, like all the rest, she had no feet, for her body ended in a fishtail. All day long they could play in the castle, down in the halls, where living flowers grew out of the walls. The great amber windows were opened, and then the fishes swam into them, just as the swallows fly into us when we open our windows. But the fishes swam straight up to the princesses, ate out of their hands, and let themselves be stroked. Outside the castle was a great garden with bright red and dark blue flowers. The fruit glowed like gold, and the flowers like flames of fire and they continually kept moving their stalks and leaves. The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as the flame of brimstone. A peculiar blue radiance lay upon everything down there. One would have thought oneself high in the air, with the canopy of heaven above and around, rather than at the bottom of the deep sea. During a calm, the sun could be seen. It appeared like a purple flower from which all light streamed out. Each of the little princesses had her own little place in the garden where she might dig and plant at her good pleasure. One gave her flower bed the form of a whale Another thought, it might be better to make hers like a little mermaid. But the youngest made hers quite round, like the sun, and had only flowers which gleamed red as the sun itself. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful. And when the other sisters made a display of the beautiful things they had received out of wrecked ships, she would have nothing beyond the red flowers which resembled the sun. 
except a pretty marble statue. This was a figure of a charming boy, hewn out of white clear stone, which had sunk down to the bottom of the sea from a wreck. She planted a pink weeping willow beside the statue. The tree grew famously and hung its fresh branches over the statue towards the blue sandy ground, where the shadow showed violet and moved like the branches themselves. It seemed as if the ends of the branches and the roots were playing together and wished to kiss each other. There was no greater pleasure for her than to hear of the world of men above them. The old grandmother had to tell all she knew of ships and towns, of men and animals. It seemed particularly beautiful to her that up on the earth the flowers shed fragrance, for they had none down at the bottom of the sea, and that the trees were green, and that the fishes which one saw there among the trees could sing so loud and clear that it was a pleasure to hear them. What the grandmother called fishes were the little birds, otherwise they could not have understood her, for they had never seen a bird. When you have completed your fifteenth year, said the grandmother, you shall leave to rise up out of the sea, to sit on the rocks in the moonlight, and to see the great ships sailing by. Then you will see forests and towns. In the next year, one of the sisters was fifteen years of age, but each of the others was one year younger than the next, so that the youngest had full five years to wait before she could come up from the bottom of the sea and find out how our world looked. But one promised to tell the others what she had seen and what she had thought the most beautiful on the first day of her visit. For their grandmother could not tell them enough. There was so much about which they wanted information. No one was more anxious about these things than the youngest, just that one who had the longest time to wait and who was always quiet and thoughtful. Many a night she stood by the open window and looked up through the dark blue water at the fishes splashing with their fins and tails. Moon and stars she could see. They certainly shone quite faintly, but through the water they looked much larger than they appear in our eyes. When something like a black cloud passed among them, she knew that it was either a whale swimming over her head or a ship with many people. They certainly did not think that a pretty little sea maid was standing down below stretching up her white hands towards the keel of their ship. Now the eldest princess was fifteen years old and might mount up to the surface of the sea. When she came back she had a hundred things to tell. But the finest thing, she said, was to lie in the moonshine on a sandbank in the quiet sea and to look at the neighboring coast with the large town where the lights twinkled like a hundred stars and to hear the music and the noise and the clamor of carriages and men, to see the many church steeples and to hear the sound of the bells. 
just because she could not get up to these, she longed for them more than anything. Oh, how the youngest sister listened! And afterwards, when she stood at the open window and looked up through the dark blue water, she thought of the great city with all its bustle and noise, and then she thought she could hear the church bells ringing, even down to the depth where she was. In the following year, the second sister received permission to mount upward through the water and to swim whither she pleased. She rose up just as the sun was setting, and this spectacle, she said, was the most beautiful. The whole sky looked like gold, she said, and as to the clouds, she could not properly describe their beauty. They sailed away over her head, purple and violet colored, but far quicker than the clouds there flew a flight of wild swans, like a long white veil over the water towards where the sun stood. She swam towards them, but the sun sank, and the roseate hue faded on the sea and in the clouds. In the following year, the next sister went up. She was the boldest of them all, and therefore she swam up a broad stream that poured its waters into the sea. She saw glorious green hills clothed with vines, palaces and castles peeped forth from amid splendid woods. She heard how all the birds sang, and the sun shone so warm that she was often obliged to dive under the water to cool her glowing face. In a little bay, she found a whole swarm of little mortals. They were quite naked and splashed about in the water. She wanted to play with them, but they fled in a fright, and a little black animal came. It was a dog, but she had never seen a dog, and it barked at her so terribly that she became frightened and made out to the open sea. But she could never forget the glorious woods, the green hills, and the pretty children who could swim in the water, though they had not fish tails. The fourth sister was not so bold. She remained out in the midst of the wild sea and declared that just there it was most beautiful. One could see for many miles around, and the sky above looked like a bell of glass. She had seen ships, but only in the far distance. They looked like seagulls, and the funny dolphins had thrown somersaults, and the great whales spouted out water from their nostrils, so that it looked like hundreds of fountains all around. Now came the turn of the fifth sister. Her birthday came in the winter, and so she saw what the others had not seen the first time. The sea looked quite green, and great icebergs were floating about. Each one appeared like a pearl, she said, and yet was much taller than the church steeples built by men. They showed themselves in the strangest forms and shone like diamonds. She had seated herself upon one of the greatest of all and let the wind play with her long hair and all the sailing ships tacked about in great alarm to get beyond where she sat. 
but towards evening the sky became covered with clouds. It thundered and lightened, and the black waves lifted the great ice blocks high up and let them glow in the red glare. On all the ships the sails were reefed, and there was fear and anguish. But she sat quietly upon her floating iceberg and saw the forked blue flashes dart into the sea. Each of the sisters, as she came up for the first time to the surface of the water, was delighted with the new and beautiful sights she saw. But, as they now had permission, as grown-up girls, to go whenever they liked, it became indifferent to them. They wished themselves back again, and after a month had elapsed, they said it was the best of all down below, for there one felt so comfortably at home. Many an evening hour the five sisters took one another by the arm and rose up in a row over the water. They had splendid voices, more charming than any mortal could have, and when a storm was approaching, so that they might expect that ships would go down, they swam on before the ships and sang lovely songs, which told how beautiful it was at the bottom of the sea, and exhorted the sailors not to be afraid to come down. But these could not understand the words and thought it was the storm sighing, and they did not see the splendors below, for if the ship sank, they were drowned, and came as corpses to the sea king's palace. When the sisters thus rose up, arm in arm, in the evening time through the water, the little sister stood all alone looking after them and she felt as if she must weep. But the sea maid has no tears, and for this reason she suffers far more acutely. Oh, if I were only fifteen years old, said she, I know I shall love the world up there very much, and the people who live and dwell there, at last, she was really fifteen years old. Now, you see, you are grown up, said the grandmother, the old dowager. Come, let me adorn you like your sisters. And she put a wreath of white lilies in the little maid's hair, but each petal in the flower was half a pearl and the old lady let eight great oysters attach themselves to the princess's tail in token of her high rank. But that hurts so, said the little sea maid. Yes, one must suffer something for the sake of rank, replied the old lady. Oh, how glad she would have been to shake off all the tokens of rank and lay aside the heavy reef. Her red flowers in the garden suited her better, but she could not help it. Farewell, she said, and then she rose, light and clear as a water bubble, up, 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 through the sea. The sun had just set when she lifted her head above the sea, but all the clouds still shone like roses and gold, and in the pale red sky the evening star gleamed bright and beautiful. The air was mild and fresh, and the sea quite calm. There lay a great ship with three masts, one single sail only was set, 
for not a breeze stirred, and around in the shrouds and on the yards sat the sailors. There was music and singing, and as the evening closed in, hundreds of colored lanterns were lighted up and looked as if the flags of every nation were waving in the air. The little sea maid swam straight to the cabin window, and each time the sea lifted her up, she could look through the panes, which were clear as crystal, and see many people standing within, dressed in their best. But the handsomest of all, was the young prince with the great black eyes. He was certainly not much more than sixteen years old. It was his birthday, and that was the cause of all this festivity. The sailors were dancing upon deck, and when the young prince came out, more than a hundred rockets rose into the air. They shone like day, so that the little sea maid was quite startled and dived under the water. But soon she put out her head again, and then it seemed just as if all the stars of heaven were falling down upon her. She had never seen such fireworks. Great suns whirled around, glorious fiery fishes flew up into the blue air, and everything was mirrored in the clear blue sea. The ship itself was so brightly lit up that every separate rope could be seen, and the people therefore appeared the more plainly. Oh, how handsome the young prince was! And he pressed the people's hands and smiled, while the music rang out in the glorious night. It became late, but the little sea maid could not turn her eyes from the ship and from the beautiful prince. The colored lanterns were extinguished, Rockets ceased to fly into the air, and no more cannons were fired. But there was a murmuring and a buzzing deep down in the sea, and she sat on the water, swaying up and down so that she could look into the cabin. But as the ship got more away, one sail after another was spread, and now the waves rose higher. Great clouds came up, and in the distance there was lightning. Oh, it was going to be fearful weather. Therefore the sailors furled the sails. The great ship flew in swift career over the wild sea. The waters rose up like great black mountains which wanted to roll over the masts. But like a swan, the ship dived into valleys between these high waves and then let itself be lifted on high again. To the little sea maid, this seemed merry sport, but to the sailors, it appeared very differently. The ship groaned and creaked. The thick planks were bent by the heavy blows. The sea broke into the ship. The main mast snapped in two like a thin reed, and the ship lay over on her side, while the water rushed into the hold. Now the little sea maid saw that the people were in peril. She herself was obliged to take care to avoid the beams and fragments of the ship which were floating about on the waters. One moment it was so pitch dark that not a single object could be described, but when it lightened 
it became so bright that she could distinguish every one on board. Every one was doing the best he could for himself. She looked particularly for the young prince, and when the ship parted, she saw him sink into the sea. At first she was very glad, for now he would come down to her. But then she remembered that people could not live in the water, and that when he got down to her father's palace, he would certainly be dead. No, he must not die. So she swam about among the beams and planks that strewed the surface, quite forgetting that one of them might have crushed her. Diving down deep under the water, she again rose high up among the waves, and in this way she at last came to the prince, who could scarcely swim longer in that stormy sea. His arms and legs began to fail him. His beautiful eyes closed, and he would have died had the little sea maid not come. She held his head up over the water and then allowed the waves to carry her and him whither they listed. When the morning came, the storm had passed by. Of the ship, not a fragment was to be seen. The sun came up red and shining out of the water. It was as if its beams brought back the hue of life to the cheeks of the prince, but his eyes remained closed. The sea maid kissed his high, fair forehead and put back his wet hair, and he seemed to her to be like the marble statue in her little garden. She kissed him again and hoped that he might live. Now she saw in front of her the dry land, high blue mountains on whose summits the white snow gleamed as if swans were lying there. Down on the coast were glorious green forests, and a building, she could not tell whether it was a church or a convent, stood there. In its garden grew orange and citron trees, and high palms waved in front of the gate. The sea formed a little bay there. It was quite calm, but very deep straight towards the rock where the fine white sand had been cast up, she swam with the handsome prince and laid him upon the sand, taking special care that his head was raised in the warm sunshine. Now all the bells rang in the great white building, and many young girls came walking through the garden. Then, the little sea maid swam further out between some high stones that stood up out of the water, laid some sea foam upon her hair and neck so that no one could see her little face, and then she watched to see who would come to the poor prince. In a short time, a young girl went that way. She seemed be much startled, but only for a moment. Then she brought more people, and the sea maid perceived that the prince came back to life, and that he smiled at all around him. But he did not cast a smile at her. He did not know that she had saved him, and she felt very sorrowful. And when he was taken away into the great building, she dived mournfully under the water and returned to her father's palace. 
She had always been gentle and melancholy, but now she became much more so. Her sisters asked her what she had seen the first time she rose up to the surface, but she would tell them nothing. Many an evening and many a morning she went up to the place where she had left the prince. She saw how the fruits of the garden grew ripe and were gathered. She saw how the snow melted on the high mountain. But she did not see the prince. And so she always returned home more sorrowful still. Then her only comfort was to sit in her little garden and to wind her arms round the beautiful marble statue that resembled the prince. But she did not tend her flowers. They grew as if in a wilderness over the paths and trailed their long leaves and stalks up into the branches of trees so that it became quite dark there. At last, she could endure it no longer, and told all to one of her sisters. And then the others heard of it too. But nobody knew of it beyond these, and a few other sea maids, who told the secret to their intimate friends. One of these knew who the prince was. She too had seen the festival on board the ship and she announced whence he came and where his kingdom lay. Come, little sister, said the other princesses, and linking their arms together, they rose up in a long row out of the sea at the place where they knew the prince's palace stood. This palace was built of a kind of bright yellow stone with great marble staircases, one of which led directly down into the sea. Over the roof rose splendid gilt cupolas, and between the pillars which surrounded the whole dwelling stood marble statues which looked as if they were alive. Through the clear glass in the high windows, one looked into the glorious halls, where costly silk hangings and tapestries were hung up, and all the walls were decked with splendid pictures, so that it was a perfect delight to see them. In the midst of the greatest of these halls, a great fountain splashed. Its jets shot high up towards the glass dome in the ceiling, through which the sun shone down upon the water and upon the lovely plants growing in the great basin. Now she knew where he lived, and many an evening and many a night she spent there on the water. She swam far closer to the land than any of the others would have dared to venture. Indeed, she was quite up the narrow channel under the splendid marble balcony which threw a broad shadow upon the water. Here she sat and watched the young prince, who thought himself quite alone in the bright moonlight. Many an evening she saw him sailing amid the sounds of music, in his costly boat with the waving flags, she peered up through the green reeds, and when the wind caught her silver-white veil, and anyone saw it, they thought it was a white swan spreading its wings. Many a night, when the fishermen were on the sea with their torches, she heard much good told of the young prince, and she rejoiced that she had saved his life when he was driven about, half dead, on the wild billows. She thought how quietly his head had reclined on her bosom, 
and how heartily she had kissed him. But he knew nothing of it, and could not even dream of her. More and more, she began to love mankind, and more and more, she wished to be able to wander out among those whose world seemed far larger than her own. For they could fly over the sea in ships, and mount up the high hills far above the clouds, and the lands they possessed stretched out in woods and fields farther than her eyes could reach. There was much she wished to know, but her sisters could not answer all her questions. Therefore she applied to the old grandmother, and the old lady knew the upper world, which she rightly called the countries above the sea. If people are not drowned, asked the little sea maid, can they live forever? Do they not die as we die down here on the sea? Yes, replied the old lady, they too must die, and their life is even shorter than ours. We can live to be three hundred years old, but when we cease to exist here, we are turned into foam on the surface of the water and have not even a grave down here among those we love. We have not an immortal soul. We never receive another life. We are like the green seaweed, which, when once cut through, can never bloom again. Men, on the contrary, have a soul which lives forever which lives on after the body has become dust. It mounts up through the clear air, up toward the shining stars. As we rise up out of the waters and behold all the lands of the earth, so they rise up to an unknown, glorious place which we can never see. Why did we not receive an immortal soul? asked the little sea maid sorrowfully. I would gladly give all the hundreds of years I have to be a human being only for one day and to have a hope of partaking the heavenly kingdom. You must not think of that, replied the old lady. We feel ourselves far more happy and far better than mankind yonder. Then I am to die and to float as foam upon the sea, not hearing the music of the waves, nor seeing the pretty flowers in the red sun. Can I not do anything to win an immortal soul? No, answered the grandmother. Only if a man were to love you, so that you should be more to him than father or mother, if he should cling to you with his every thought, and with all his love, and let the priest lay his right hand in yours, with a promise of faithfulness here and in all eternity, then his soul would be imparted to your body and you would receive a share of the happiness of mankind. He would give a soul to you, and yet retain his own. But that can never come to pass. What is considered beautiful here in the sea, the fish tail, they would consider ugly on the earth. They don't understand it. Their one must have two clumsy supports, which they call legs, to be called beautiful. Then the sea maid sighed and looked mournfully upon her fishtail. Let us be glad, 
said the old lady. Let us dance and leap in the three hundred years we have to live. That is certainly long enough. After that, we can rest ourselves all the better. This evening, we shall have a court ball. It was a splendid sight such as is never seen on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the great dancing saloon were all of thick but transparent glass. Several hundreds of huge shells, pink and grass green, stood on each side in rows, filled with a blue fire which lit up the whole hall and shone through the walls so that the sea without was quite lit up. One could see all the innumerable fishes, great and small, swimming towards the glass walls. Of some the scales gleamed with purple, while in others they shone like silver and gold. Through the mist of the hall flowed a broad stream, and on this the seamen and sea women danced to their own charming songs. Such beautiful voices the people of the earth have not. The little sea maid sang the most sweetly of all, and the whole court applauded her, and for a moment she felt gay in her heart, for she knew she had the loveliest voice of all in the sea or on the earth. But soon she thought again of the world above her, she could not forget the charming prince or her sorrow at not having an immortal soul like his. Therefore, she crept out of her father's palace, and while everything within was joy and gladness, she sat melancholy in her little garden. Then she heard the bugle horn sounding through the waters and thought, Now he is certainly sailing above, he whom I love more than father or mother, he on whom my wishes hang, and in whose hand I should like to lay my life's happiness. I will dare everything to win him and an immortal soul. While my sisters dance yonder in my father's palace, I will go to the sea witch, of whom I have always been so much afraid. Perhaps she can counsel and help me. Now the little sea maid went out of her garden to the foaming whirlpools behind which the sorceress dwelt. She had never traveled that way before. No flowers grew there, no sea grass. Only the bare gray sand stretched out towards the whirlpools, where the water rushed around like warring mill wheels and tore down everything it seized into the deep. Through the mist of these rushing whirlpools, she was obliged to pass to get into the domain of the witch, and for a long way there was no other road except one which led over warm, bubbling mud. This the witch called her peat moss. Behind it lay her house in the midst of a singular forest in which all the trees and bushes were polypes, half animals, half plants. They looked like hundred-headed snakes growing out of the earth. All the branches were long, slimy arms with fingers like supple snakes, and they moved joint by joint from the root to the farthest point, all that they could seize on in the water, they held fast and never again let it go. The little sea maid stopped in front of them, quite frightened. Her heart beat with fear, and she was
was nearly turning back, but, but then she thought of the prince and the human soul, and her courage came back again. She bound her long flying hair closely around her head so that the polypies might not seize it. She put her hands together on her breast and then shot forward as a fish shoots through the water among the ugly polypies which stretched out their supple arms and fingers at her. She saw that each of them held something it had seized with hundreds of little arms like strong iron bands. Who had perished at sea and had sunk deep down, looked forth as white skeletons from among the polypes' arms. Ships, rudders, and chests they also held fast, and skeletons of land animals, and a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled. And this seemed the most terrible of all to our little princess. Now she came to a great marshy place in the wood, where fat water snakes rolled about, showing their ugly cream-colored bodies. In the midst of this marsh was a house built of white bones of shipwrecked men. There sat the sea witch, feeding a toad out of her mouth, just as a person might feed a little canary bird with sugar. She called the ugly fat water snakes her little chickens and allowed them to crawl upwards all about her. I know what you want, said the sea witch. It is stupid of you, but you shall have your way, for it will bring you to grief, my pretty princess. You want to get rid of your fish tail and to have two supports instead of it, like those the people of the earth walk with, so that the young prince may fall in love with you and you may get him and an immortal soul. And with this, the witch laughed loudly and disagreeably, so that the toad and the water snakes tumbled down to the ground where they crawled about. You come just in time, said the witch. After tomorrow at sunrise, I could not help you until another year had gone by. I will prepare a draft for you, with which you must swim to land tomorrow before the sun rises, and seat yourself there and drink it. Then your tail will part in two and shrink in and become what the people of the earth call beautiful eggs. But it will hurt you. It will seem as if you were cut with a sharp sword. All who see you would declare you to be the prettiest human being they ever beheld. You will keep your graceful walk. No dancer will be able to move so lightly as you. But every step you take will be as if you trod upon sharp knives and as if your blood must flow. If you will bear all this, I can help you. Yes, said the little sea maid with a trembling voice, and she thought of the prince and the immortal soul. But remember, said the witch, when you have once received a human form, you can never be a sea maid again. You can never return through the water to your sisters or to your father's palace, and if you do not win the prince's love, so that he forgets father and mother for your sake, is attached to you heart and soul, and tells the priest to join your hands, you will not receive an immortal soul. 
on the first morning after he has married another, your heart will break and you will become foam upon the water. I will do it, said the little sea maid, but she became as pale as death. But you must pay me too, said the witch, and it is not a trifle that I ask. You have the finest voice of all here at the bottom of the water. With that you think to enchant him, but this voice you must give to me. The best thing you possess I will have for my costly draught. I must give you my own blood in it, so that the draught may be sharp as a two edged sword. But if you take away my voice, said the little sea maid, what will remain of me? Your beautiful form, replied the witch, your graceful walk, and your eloquent eyes, with those you can take captive a human heart. Well, have you lost your courage? Put out your little tongue, and then I will cut it off for my payment, and then you shall have a strong draught. Let it be so, said the little sea maid. And the witch put on her pot to brew the draught. Cleanliness is a good thing said she, and she cleaned out the pot with the snakes, which she tied up in a big knot, then she scratched herself, and let her black blood drop into it. The steam rose up in the strangest forms, enough to frighten the beholder. Every moment the witch threw something else into the pot, and when it boiled thoroughly, there was a sound like the weeping of a crocodile. At last, the draught was ready. It looked like the purest water. There you have it, said the witch. And she cut off the little sea maid's tongue so that now she was dumb and could neither sing nor speak. If the polypays should lay hold of you when you are returning through my forest, said the witch, just cast a single drop of this liquor upon them and their arms and fingers will fly into a thousand pieces. But the little sea maid had no need to do this, the polypes drew back in terror when they saw the shining liquor that gleamed in her hand as if it were a twinkling star. In this way she soon passed through the forest, the moss, and the rushing whirlpools. She could see her father's palace. The torches were extinguished in the great dancing hall and they were certainly sleeping within. But she did not dare to go to them, now that she was dumb and was about to quit them forever. She felt as if her heart would burst with sorrow. She crept into the garden, took a flower from each of her sister's flower beds, blew a thousand kisses towards the palace, and rose up the dark blue sea. The sun had not yet risen when she beheld the prince's castle and mounted the splendid marble staircase. The moon shone beautifully clear. The little sea maid drank the burning sharp draught and it seemed as if a two-edged sword went through her delicate body. 
she fell down in a swoon and lay as if she were dead. When the sun shone out over the sea, she awoke and felt a sharp pain. But just before her stood the handsome young prince. He fixed his coal-black eyes upon her so that she cast down her own, and then she perceived that her fishtail was gone and that she had the prettiest pair of white feet a little girl could have. But she had no clothes, so she shrouded herself in her long hair. The prince asked who she was and how she had come there, and she looked at him mildly, but very mournfully, and with her dark blue eyes, for she could not speak. Then he took her by the hand and led her into the castle. Each step she took as the witch had told her, as if she had been treading on pointed needles and sharp knives. But she bore it gladly. At the prince's right hand she moved on, light as a soap bubble, and he, like all the rest, was astonished at her graceful swaying movements. She now received splendid clothes of silk and muslin. In the castle she was the most beautiful of all, but she was dumb and could neither sing nor speak. Lovely slaves dressed in silk and gold stepped forward and sang before the prince and his royal parents. One sang more charmingly than all the rest, and the prince smiled at her and clapped his hands. Then the little sea maid became sad. She knew that she herself had sung far more sweetly and thought, Oh, if only he could know that I had given away my voice for ever be with him. Now the slaves danced pretty waving dances to the loveliest music. Then the little sea maid lifted her beautiful white arms, stood on the tips of her toes, and glided dancing over the floor as no one had yet danced. And each movement her beauty became more apparent and her eyes spoke more directly to the heart than the songs of the slaves. All were delighted, and especially the prince, who called her his little floundling, and she danced again and again, although every time she touched the earth it seemed as if she were treading upon sharp knives. The prince said that she should always remain with him, and she received permission to sleep on a velvet cushion before his door. He had a page's dress made for her that she might accompany him on horseback. They rode through the fragrant woods where the green bows swept their shoulders and the little birds sang in the fresh leaves. She climbed with the prince up the high mountains, and although her delicate feet pled so that even the others could see it, she laughed at it herself and followed him until they saw the clouds sailing beneath them like a flock of birds travelling to distant lands. At home in the prince's castle, when the others slept at night, she went out onto the broad marble steps. It cooled her burning feet to stand in the cold sea water, and then she thought of the dear ones in the deep. Once, in the night time, her sisters came arm in arm. Sadly, they sang as they floated above the water, and she beckoned to them, and they recognized her, 
and told her how she had grieved them all. Then they visited her every night, and once she saw in the distance her old grandmother, who had not been above the surface for many years, and the sea king with his crown upon his head. They stretched out their hands towards her, but did not venture so near the land as her sisters. Day by day, the prince grew more fond of her. He loved her as one loves a dear good child, but it never came into his head to make her his wife. And yet she must become his wife, or she would not receive an immortal soul, and would have to become foam on the sea on his wedding morning. Do you not love me best of all? The eyes of the little sea maid seemed to say when he took her in his arms and kissed her fair forehead. Yes, you are dearest to me, said the prince, for you have the best heart of them all. You are the most devoted to me and are like a young girl who I once saw but whom I certainly shall not find again. I was on board a ship which was wrecked. The waves threw me ashore near a holy temple where several young girls performed the service. The youngest of them found me by the shore and saved my life. I only saw her twice. She was the only one in the world I could love. But you chase her picture out of my mind. You are so like her. She belongs to the holy temple, and therefore my good fortune has sent you to me. We will never part. Ah, oh, he does not know that I saved his life, thought the little sea maid. I carried him over the sea to the wood where the temple stands. I sat there under the foam and looked to see if any one would come. I saw the beautiful girl whom he loves better than me. And the sea maid sighed deeply. She could not weep. The maiden belongs to the holy temple, he has said, and will never come out into the world. They will meet no more. I am with him and see him every day. I will cherish him, love him, give up my life for him. But now they said that the prince was to marry, and that the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king was to be his wife, and that was why such a beautiful ship was being prepared. The story was that the prince travelled to visit the land of the neighbouring king, but it was done that he might see the king's daughter. A great company was to go with him. The little sea maid shook her head and smiled. She knew the prince's thoughts far better than any of the others. I must travel, he said to her. I must see the beautiful princess. My parents desire it, but they do not wish to compel me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her. She is not like the beautiful maiden in the temple whom you resemble. If I were to choose a bride, I would rather choose you, my dear dumb foundling with the speaking eyes. And he kissed her red lips and played with her long hair so that she dreamed of happiness and of an immortal soul. You are not afraid of the sea, my dumb child, said he when they stood on a superb ship which was to carry him to the country of the neighboring king. And he told her of storm and calm, of strange fishes in the deep, and of what the divers had seen there. And she smiled at his tales, for she knew better than anyone 
what there was at the bottom of the sea. In the moonlit night, when all were asleep, except the steersman who stood by the helm, she sat on the side of the ship, gazing down through the clear water. She fancied she saw her father's palace. High on the battlements stood her old grandmother, with the silver crown on her head, and looking through the rushing tide up to the vessel's keel. Then her sisters came forth over the water, and looked mournfully at her, and wrung their white hands. She beckoned to them, smiled, and wished to tell them that she was well and happy. But the cabin boy approached her, and her sisters dived down, so that he thought the white objects he had seen were foam on the surface of the water. The next morning, the ship sailed into the harbor of the neighboring king's splendid city. All the church bells sounded, and from the high towers the trumpets were blown, while the soldiers stood there with flying colors and flashing bayonets. Each day brought some festivity with it. Balls and entertainments followed one another, but the princess was not yet there. People said she was being educated in a holy temple, far away, where she was learning every royal virtue. At last she arrived. The little sea maid was anxious to see the beauty of the princess and was obliged to acknowledge it. A more lovely apparition she had never beheld. The princess's skin was pure and clear, and behind the long dark eyelashes there smiled a pair of faithful dark blue eyes. You are the lady who saved me when I lay like a corpse upon the shore, said the prince, and he folded the blushing bride to his heart. Oh, I am too, too happy, he cried to the little sea maid. The best hope I could have is fulfilled. You will rejoice at my happiness, for you are the most devoted to me of them all. And the little sea maid kissed his hand, and it seemed already to her as if her heart was broken, for his wedding morning was to bring death to her and change her into foam on the sea. All the church bells were ringing and heralds rode about the streets announcing the betrothal. On every altar fragrant oil was burning in glorious lamps of silver. The priests swung their censers and bride and bridegroom laid hand in hand and received the bishop's blessing. The little sea maid was dressed in cloth of gold and held up the bride's train, but her ears heard nothing of the festive music. Her eye marked not the holy ceremony. She thought of the night of her death and of all that she had lost in this world. On the same evening, bride and bridegroom went on board the ship. The, the cannon roared, all the flags waved. In the midst of the ship a costly tent of gold and purple with the most beautiful cushions had been set up, and there the married pair were to sleep in the cool, still night. The sails swelled in the wind, and the ship glided smoothly and lightly over the clear sea. When it grew dark, colored lamps were lighted, and the sailors danced merry dances on deck. The little sea maid thought of the first time when she had risen up out of the sea and beheld a similar scene of splendor and joy, and she joined in the whirling dance and flitted on as the swallow flits away when he is pursued, and all shouted and admired her, 
for she had danced so prettily. Her delicate feet were cut as if with knives, but she did not feel it, for her heart was wounded far more painfully. She knew this was the last evening on which she would see him for whom she had left her friends and her home and had given up her beautiful voice and had suffered unheard of pains every day while he was utterly unconscious of all. It was the last evening she would breathe the same air with him and behold the starry sky and the deep sea, and everlasting night without thought or dream awaited her, for she had no soul, and could win none. And everything was merriment and gladness on the ship, till past midnight, and she laughed and danced with thoughts of death in her heart. The prince kissed his beautiful bride, and she played with his raven hair, and hand in hand they went to rest in the splendid tent. It became quiet on the ship. Only the helmsman stood by the helm, and the little sea maid leaned her white arms upon the bulwark and gazed out towards the east for the morning dawn. The first ray she knew would kill her. Then, she saw her sisters rising out of the flood. They were pale, like herself. Their long, beautiful hair no longer waved in the wind. It had been cut off. We have given it to the witch, that she might bring you help, so that you may not die tonight. She had given us a knife. Here it is. Look. How sharp! Before the sun rises, you must thrust it into the heart of the prince, and when the warm blood flows upon your feet, they will grow together again into a fishtail, and you will become a sea maid again, and come back to us, and live your three hundred years before you become dead salt sea foam. Make haste, he or you, must die before the sun rises. Our old grandmother mourns so that her white hair has fallen off as art did under the witch's scissors. Kill the prince and come back. Make haste. Do you see that red streak in the sky? In a few minutes the sun will rise and you must die. And they gave a very mournful sigh, and vanished beneath the waves. The little sea maid drew back the purple curtain from the tent, and saw the beautiful bride lying with her head on the prince's breast, and she bent down and kissed his brow, and gazed up to the sky where the morning red was gleaming brighter and brighter. Then she looked at the sharp knife, and again fixed her eyes upon the prince, who in his sleep murmured his bride's name. She only was in his thoughts, and the knife trembled in the sea maid's hand. Then she flung it far away into the waves. They gleamed red where it fell, and it seemed as if drops of blood spurted up out of the water. Once more she looked with half-extinguished eyes upon the prince. Then she threw herself from the ship into the sea and felt her frame dissolving into foam. Now the sun rose up out of the sea, 
The rays fell mild and warm upon the cold sea foam, and the little sea maid felt nothing of death. She saw the bright sun, and over her head sailed hundreds of glorious ethereal beings. She could see them through the white sails of the ship and the red clouds of the sky. Their speech was melody, but of such a spiritual kind that no human ear could hear it, just as no earthly eye could see them. Without wings, they floated through the air. The little sea maid found that she had a frame like these, and was rising more and more out of the foam. Where am I going? she asked, and her voice sounded like that of the other beings, so spiritual that no earthly music could be compared to it. To the daughters of the air, replied the others. A sea maid has no immortal soul, and can never gain one, except she win the love of a mortal. Her eternal existence depends upon the power of another. The daughters of the air have likewise no immortal soul, but they can make themselves one through good deeds. We fly to the hot countries, where the close pestilent air kills men, and there we bring coolness. We disperse the fragrance of the flowers through the air, and spread refreshment and health. After we have striven for three hundred years to accomplish all the good we can bring about, we receive an immortal soul and take part in the eternal happiness of men. You, poor little sea maid, have striven with your whole heart after the goal we pursue. You have suffered and endured. You have, by good works, raised yourself to the world of spirits and can gain an immortal soul after three hundred years. And the little sea maid lifted her bright arms towards God's son, and for the first time she felt tears. On the ship there was again life and noise. She saw the prince and his bride searching for her. Then they looked mournfully at the pearly foam, as if they knew that she had thrown herself into the waves. Invisible, she kissed the forehead of the bride, smiled to the prince, and mounted with the other children of the air on the rosy cloud which floated through the ether. After three hundred years, we shall thus float into paradise. And we may even get there sooner, whispered one. Invisibly, we float into the houses of men where children are, and for every day on which we find a good child that brings joy to its parents and deserves their love, our time of probation is shortened. The child does not know when we fly through the room, and when we smile with joy at the child's conduct, a year is counted off from the three hundred. But when we see a naughty or a wicked child, we shed tears of grief, and for every tear a day is added to our time of trial. The end.